Hey, what's up you guys? I got another story here for you in this little fishtails series that I'm doing. In the last episode, if you missed it, I talked about the biggest bass of my life, which was an eight pound largemouth bass caught in Wisconsin. And it was net by a little girl named Lily. I'll put the link for that up right now. And I'll also probably put a link at the end of this video. But similar to that story, this fish catch I'm about to tell you about today, the biggest muskie of my life and also happens to be the biggest fish of my life, period, regardless of species. But this fish was also net by a kid. His name is Frankie. What's up, Frankie? Love you, man. Miss you. I hope I get to see you soon. We need to do some fishing. But I used to work with Frankie at one of my previous jobs a number of years ago. And it's really cool because even though we stopped working together about three to four years ago, Frankie has completely stayed in touch with me. He was just messaging me this week asking me for tips on catching some bass because he's trying to do some bass fishing. Uh, but it's awesome because it just goes to show you Frankie clearly has fishing fever. He's got the fishing bug. He has become a true angler and I love it. <laughs> it's awesome and I hope I get to fish with him in the near future. But I started working with Frankie and his younger brother Tony about probably six, seven years ago and we really developed a strong bond and obviously we spent a lot of our time fishing. What's so funny and unique about this story is that up until this point in this day and this catch, Frankie had never net a single muskie in his life, okay? So this is a very cool story, it's exciting. Um, it's not just a, a big fish catch, but the odds of me catching this fish the way that I did with Frankie netting it, it almost just shouldn't have happened. So I hope you enjoy it, uh, but real quick, I'm probably gonna put up one or two pictures. I'm gonna go find as many as I can, but I wanna put up a few pictures of Frankie with some of his best catches with me. I did a video with him about a year or so ago and I, I think we went bass fishing and I think he caught uh, probably the biggest bass of his life. He can comment down below, but I'm pretty sure it's his PB bass. And then I also have a few other pictures I think of some other bass he caught with me, maybe even his brother Tony. And I also have a picture of a pretty nice northern pike he caught, which I think is to this day still the biggest fish he's ever caught. He still wants to get a muskie. That's still one of his goals. It's one of my goals. I really, really want him to get a muskie. Maybe it'll happen this year. Uh, but he's a really good angler. He's definitely got the passion and the drive and motivation. He's, he's got the obsession like the rest of us. Uh, but hopefully you enjoy these pictures as I put them up. Without further ado, let's get to this story. So what happened uh, on this day is I was actually not supposed to go fishing at this particular spot, this particular river. I usually fish this spot only a handful of times every year. I mean, if I hit this spot four or five times in a year, that, that's a lot. That's more than average. And the reason for that is because it's a little over an hour away from my house and there are other locations that are a little bit closer and that have easier access. And so it's just a little bit less work. And as much as I hate to admit it, you guys, I'm not as young as I used to be. Uh, I got arthritis in my hips. I got ankle problems. Like I just destroyed myself wasting time playing sports and lifting weights when I was younger. So the older I get, if I can find an easier way to fish and get to muskies, I'm usually gonna pick that route. And I'm not talking about easy catching or easy waters to fish. I'm saying as a shore fisherman, it's a lot of work to carry my tackle and my net and my nine foot rod and a shorter backup rod. I mean, when you see my setup, if you ever look at everything that I have, I should probably do a video and show you guys my setup sometime. But when you look at everything that I need and I condense, I don't take all of my tackle. I, I take the bare minimum, but still, even if I've only got one or two tackle boxes and I've got one or two rods and I've got a big musky net and I'm in waders and I'm trucking through current and rocks and boulders and brush and woods, it's just a lot of physical labor. And the older I get, I'm just kind of like, man, forget all that noise. What is easier? What's quicker? I just want to cast and I want to try to catch a fish. So the point I'm trying to make is, this spot is a little bit further away than other locations I can fish a little bit closer to my home to try to catch muskies. So what happened? Why did I end up going there on this day? So I caught this fish on a Saturday, okay? The day before, which is Friday, I was at my in-laws. My wife wanted to go up and visit her parents. So I was having a conversation with my father-in-law, Rich. What's up, Rich? You deserve a lot of credit for this fish. I've told him this before, but now you guys are gonna hear it. But I was having a conversation with my father-in-law and he says, hey, are you going fishing tomorrow? And I said, actually, yeah, I am. I'm taking one of my kids that I mentor fishing, Frankie. I said, we're gonna go fishing to River A. 
and obviously that's not what it's called, but you guys get it. I can't share the information with you. Sorry, not sorry. But I said, yeah, me and Frankie are going to River A. I said, this time of year, the bite's usually good. There should be some fish in there. We should have a good chance at catching at least one. It was November and it was getting really cold really fast. Okay, so we were kind of running out of time to fish, but I love fishing that time of year because the fish get really big, really fat and thick, they get heavy. And on top of that, the fishing pressure basically dwindles to almost nothing, which is also nice. A lot of guys pack it up and stop fishing by the end of October. I'm fishing until December 31st. And some of the best catches of my life have been late, late fall, okay? So I tell him, I say, hey, yeah, this is our plan. We're going to River A, I got a good feeling. And he just responds, just in conversation, not for any real particular reason. He just says, well, when's the last time you've been to River B? Talking about a different location. And I said, you know what? I haven't been there in like five to six months. I, I went there early in the season, like middle to late May. I went there once or twice and I caught muskies both times, but I had not been back since. So now it's November. I hadn't been there in about five or six months. And so I said, you know, I haven't been there in a long time. And he just goes, why don't you go check that out? The fishing's usually good there, isn't it? And he kind of walks away after he says it. So he was just having conversation, but immediately the wheels started turning in my mind. And I thought, man, you know what? I haven't been there in a while. I've caught some really nice fish there. And this time of year, there's probably not gonna be a lot of people there because the weather's getting so bad. It's getting really cold, really fast. And just from history and past experiences, I rarely would ever see guys fishing this particular river late into the season. So last minute, simply because my father-in-law said, hey, don't go to River A, why don't you check out River B? Just like that, I did a 180, I did an about face, and I said, you know what, I'm going to River B. So I pick up Frankie the next morning really early because it's a long drive to get there. And I tell him, hey, we're not going where I said we're going. We're going to a different spot. He didn't really care. He was just excited to fish. So we get there and much to my extreme disappointment, when we get there, the water levels are ridiculously low. And I immediately realize, okay, there's a dam upstream. The dam is clearly not open. It's clearly not kicking out water. Well, I found out later, a couple weeks after this, talking to a mutual friend, the dam was actually under repair. It was getting some work done. So it was literally 100% shut down. The entire dam was not letting any water flow through at all, okay? There wasn't even a trickle coming through. All of the locks, it was completely shut down. They were doing some major repairs on this dam. So obviously that made sense. Now, going back to my, my fish catch and the day that I was there, I didn't know it right away, but the dam was getting fixed. So there was no current, zero current, you guys. I mean, there was, there was probably a little bit, but there was almost no current. The water was probably at least two feet lower than what I'm used to seeing, okay? And on top of that, the river was just full. I mean, full of dead leaves, okay? It's, it's mid to late fall, the leaves are falling off the trees. That didn't surprise me, but because there was no current and the water was so low, we basically walked up to this shallow, muddy river that was just loaded with dead leaves. And I mean, if you casted nine times out of 10 on the retrieve, you were hooking a bunch of big dead leaves. So I walk up and I look at Frankie and I say, dude, this is not good. This is really bad. To make matters worse, it's crystal clear skies, okay? There is not a cloud in the sky. The sun is out, it is high pressure. I mean, it's like, if you could check every item in the box of what you don't want when you show up to a river to go musky fishing, we checked all the boxes, okay? And so I'm just being honest with Frankie and I'm saying, this is not good. Our chances are really low, but we drove all the way here. Let's at least give it a shot. We're gonna give it at least an hour or so and see what happens and then we'll regroup. So I'm already defeated. I'm gonna be honest. At that point, when I saw the conditions, I'm just like, we're not catching squat here today, but let's, let's just be positive about it. So Frankie doesn't care. He's excited to fish. He kind of wanders off up the shoreline and just says, I'm gonna start fishing. I said, all right, me too. I'm gonna get set up and try to go for a muskie. Now to make matters even worse than I thought they already were, even though the water was full of dead leaves and the bottom was like kind of muddy, just like muck, it just was really bad. But there was clarity because it was so shallow, because the water was so low and the sun was out, I could see really far. I mean, I could see the bottom in a lot of areas. I could see really far out. I could see on the other side. So visibility was actually pretty good. And what, what made it worse is I walked probably about 50 to 75 yards back and forth just looking for a sign of life. And on rivers, you guys, 
It doesn't matter if it's minnows or shiners or if it's suckers or carp, if it's bluegill, if it's, if it's bass. I mean, it doesn't matter what it is. Usually in almost every river system, especially this time of year in the fall, you're going to run into at least something, something swimming, something alive. If anything, it's going to be junk fish, but at least you know there's bait here. The bigger fish, the predators, the game fish should be close by to eat. And I did not even see a single minnow. I did not see a carp. I did not see a panfish. And I'm just scratching my head thinking, I should have went with plan A. What was I thinking? Why did I listen to my father-in-law? This was such a waste of time. And now half of our day is going to be lost just driving around. Because I'm already thinking, we got to go to, we got to, go to a different river. We got to leave here. But I was already there and I said, you know what, fish, you have to at least cast and give it a chance. You didn't come all the way here for nothing. So you guys, I casted for almost exactly an hour. I threw on some jerk baits, some twitch baits. The last bait I had on before I was about to call it quits was a glider, one of my favorite gliders, a manta. So I'm throwing this manta, nothing, nothing, nothing. In every cast, you guys, I'm thinking there is nothing in here. Why am I even doing this? Well, I start reeling in my manta and I'm like, I'm going to try another bait. Okay, I'm going to see if... If, if there's something else that will get something to at least move, even a pike. I just wanted to see a fish show up to give me some hope. So as I'm switching off the mana and I'm putting on a mid Medusa, which there's also a cool story behind this Medusa, but I'm switching baits. Frankie walks behind me and he says, I'm going up this hill. I'm going to try up over here, which is quite a ways away with the water he was going to fish was out of sight. I would not have been able to see him. But I just say to him, just in case, I say, okay, cool. If you hear me hollering, if you hear me shouting, get down here as quick as you can because that means I have a muskie. And he says, okay, no problem. I'll head up. Again, I didn't think I was going to catch anything, but that's just being a creature of habit and being a muskie angler. You just always have to be thinking ahead. You always have to be prepared. You don't want to miss anything because it could cost you a fish. <laughs> my confidence level was so low that we were going to see one, but my musky brain said, you better tell him to be ready just in case. So he disappears. I put on this mid Medusa. I, I head up river a little bit and I'm up on a wall and this wall is a good 15 feet above the actual water. The, the water level, the river is beneath me. Okay. So I'm up on this wall. And I'm just bombing casts out there. And I probably only give this Medusa maybe 10 to 15 casts. What's funny about this Medusa is I bought this at a musky show years ago. I mean, I don't even remember how long ago. But I bought it a long time ago because I really like the pattern. It's a black walleye. It's like a black gold scale walleye pattern with an orange belly and orange tails. And it's like I said, it's a mid-Medusa. When I bought this bait, I probably had thrown it the first two years that I owned it. You know, I probably put in, I, I don't know, I'd say at least a week or two of solid fishing, giving this bait a chance to catch me something. All it caught me in those two years that I used it, all those hours casting it, was pike and a couple big bass. And so I put this bait on, and the only reason I had not sold this bait up until this point and gotten rid of it was because a friend of mine had said, I love that pattern and it catches me a lot of fish. And so I'm thinking, Oh, this bait stinks. This bait hasn't produced. I didn't even get a follow. Okay, you guys, in two years of owning this bait, I never even had a musky follow on it. Not, not even a musky looking at it. So the only thing that caused me to hold on to it a little bit longer was what this friend had said to me. So I put this bait on. I cast it 10 to 15 times. Obviously, nothing happens. And I cast it one more time and I say, look, bait, if you don't catch me a musky today, I'm selling you. You're going on the flea market. You're going online. You've had two years to get me a musky. You haven't even gotten me a follow. So if you don't get me something right now, I'm selling you. So, so you want to talk about desperation. Here I am talking to my lure like it's alive. And I'm threatening it saying, you better catch me something. Otherwise, you're getting sold. So obviously, to no surprise, I reel that cast in. No musky. So now I'm really irritated, I'm really annoyed, and I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna go back to the Manta, and, and I'm gonna give the Manta one more try, this glide bait, and if it doesn't happen, we're leaving. So I set my rod down, and the Medusa's still on there, and I didn't realize it, but I still had quite a bit of line out when I set it down. I kind of set it down next to me, leaning up against this, this bench. And so I set it down, I go to get the Manta, I get the Manta out, I set it down in front of me, I grab my rod and I go to grab the Medusa to take it off. And right as I pop the swivel open and slide it off, I kind of feel the, the lures like sandy and grainy and like dirty. And I pull it off of the swivel and I look at it and it is covered in like sand and dirt and gravel, okay? Because I didn't realize it, but when I set it down and there was too much line out, I set it down in this little muddy, sandy, dirty 
pile on the ground. And so now this Medusa that I already hate and that I want to sell and hasn't even gotten me a single musky follow in two years, now it's caked in all this junk. And so I'm like, oh my goodness. And again, I'm up on a wall, you guys. I'm up on about a 15 to 20 foot wall and the water is down all these crazy, steep, <laughs> dangerous boulders. And I'm thinking, I'm not gonna run all the way down there just to dip it in and clean it. So I'm like, just put it back on the swivel and just dip it down, open your bale, dip it down in the river, give it a couple splashes, pull it up, it should be good to go. But again, my musky brain kicked in. So I put it back on and I'm planning to just dip it and pull it back out. And my musky brain says, if you're gonna put it back in the water, you might as well cast it. And once again, you guys, I'm a pastor. I don't have the luxury of lying with my fish stories. This is 100% the truth. This is exactly what happened play by play. So my musky brain says, don't waste it, cast it. Don't just dip it, cast it. So I, I literally remember shaking my head at myself as I'm casting it, like, I can't believe I'm doing this. I'm not gonna get anything. This is so stupid, but just do it because it's the right thing to do. So I bombed this cast out there. The water's really low, and even where I cast it, it was a little bit deeper, but it was seriously like three feet of water, you guys. I mean, the, the river was so shallow on this day, the area I was fishing, the deepest point was maybe four feet of water. So I cast it into about three to four feet of water right in the middle of the river, and I'm thinking, you know, I'd already cast it there probably 20 to 30 times. But I'm thinking, if there's anything in here, it has to be in this little hole, the only deep spot, since there's no current and there's nothing going on. So I bomb it out there, I let it hit the bottom, I give it one pump up, let it hit the bottom. So I'm basically jigging my Medusa up and down off the bottom. Give it one jig, let it hit the bottom. I give it another pump, pump, two, two pops, let it hit the bottom. And on the next jig, you guys, as soon as I pump up, you guys, it felt like I was snagged on the bottom. It felt like I hit a boulder, a rock, or a log. But out of habit, just out of instinct, I set the hook and my line went straight like a wire. It just went straight right into the water and all I saw at first, it was super heavy. And again, it almost felt like a snag. I saw my line go into the water and about four feet behind it, this tail comes up out of the water and just kicks and thrashes like two times and then dives down. And right away I know because of how far behind the tail was from my leader, because I didn't see the fish at first, I just saw its tail, but I knew right then and there, this is a long fish. So of course I start shouting like crazy. Frankie, 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 Frankie. I mean, I don't want to do it. I don't want to make you guys go deaf and blow out your speakers here, but hopefully you don't got earbuds in. But I start shouting, Frankie, Frankie, Frankie. I just, I don't know how many times I said his name in a row, but I just kept repeating it. And you guys, you couldn't write a better story and it couldn't have played out any better because he was ready. I mean, this kid was just on his game. And at the time he was only 13 years old. And again, he had never net a muskie in his life but I had no choice. I'm up on a wall, going down these boulders. It would have been too hard, too difficult, too risky. The odds of losing a fish trying to net it by myself that way, it's, it's very high. It's very likely I'll, I would have lost it. So I yell his name probably six or seven times and he comes flying down this hill. And again, I'm watching my fish, but I can see him in my peripheral vision. And he comes flying down this hill, sprinting by me. And he's, as he's running by me, I got it, I got it, I got it. And he runs around me and he starts jumping and hopping down these boulders, which are, are not safe and they're slippery and it's dangerous. And just like that, he's down there and he picks up the net literally as I'm, I mean, I was probably the fish, I should say, I was trying to walk it over him. The fish was probably about 10 feet away, maybe 15 feet away from him as he's grabbing the net. So the timing was perfect. And so as I'm walking it to him and he's starting to dip the net in the water, I'm giving him instructions on how to net because he's never done it before. I'm saying, don't put the whole net in the water. I said, put about half of it in there and put it in at an angle. And again, I don't have much time. So it's like one and done. I got one shot at this. My, my instructions better be perfect. And hopefully he understands at least half of what I'm saying. And I'm saying, don't put it all the way in, put it kind of in at an angle. And I said, I'll never forget. I said, once the rim of the net gets just past his belly, start lifting up, okay? And the reason for that, you guys, is if you start lifting too early, especially on a bigger fish, and it starts to bend and hang on the bar of the net, if you lift too early and there's too much weight on the back end, it will slide out in the hooks. Like, like if this is the bar of the net and it's sliding backwards and it's falling out of the net, the hooks will get caught on the net, on either on a part of the net or the bar itself. And as soon as that musky thrashes, fish is gone, game over, okay? So that's just a little tip for you if you're a musky angler. 
you want to lift up at some point because what will happen is the weight of the fish will just cause the fish to fall in and you basically got them. It's in, unless you drop the net or twist or turn it, you're not going to lose them after that point. You know, muskies sometimes will try to jump out of the net and whatnot, but there's a certain point where you need to lift to secure the fish and it'll fall right in and you're good to go. But if you lift a little bit too early and there's just a little bit too much weight still on the outside of the, the rim of that net, it'll backfire on you and it'll slide out and the hooks will pop out. So I give them this last instruction, let the net, the bar of the net, let it get just past its belly and, and then start lifting. Because my hope was he's a 13 year old kid, he's never netted a muskie before in his life. If he times it right, the fish will basically net itself and just fall in. And then he's got to hold on for dear life until I get down there to him to take care of the rest. So this story would not be complete without a little bit of suspense, right? I shout out these quick instructions and by the time I finish that last sentence, the muskie is at the net and he's reaching for it. So I'm pulling it in, I'm trying to kind of horse it in. The fish came up and it was head shaking, but it kind of went limp for a second. And so I'm trying to horse it in and right as he's reaching for it, and he's, he's reaching as far as he can, he sticks his arms out, the fish is coming into the net, and unfortunately, he starts to lift a tad early, and I'm in my mind, internally, I'm about to have a panic attack, but I'm like, you cannot yell at this kid no matter what happens, because he's a kid, okay? But I'm panicking inside. I'm like, I see this happening, and in my mind, I see the fish getting off, and I see the fish swimming away, and I'm thinking, it's game over. He tried his best, but it's not meant to be. And he starts lifting, and the fish, just like I described, starts to slide back out of the net. And all I'm thinking is, one second more, and it's gonna get hooks in the net, she's gone. But this kid had the presence of mind, and I never talked to him about doing this. He had the, the knee-jerk response, the gut reaction, whatever you wanna call it, his intuition, he had the presence of mind. As soon as he realized it started falling out, he saw it and he could feel the weight. He was losing it. This kid popped the net out as far as he could because he was starting to scoop and pull in. And when he saw it sliding out, he popped it out a little further and he gave it a little pop. He pushed down on the end of the handle. So he went like this. So he stuck it out further and then gave it a little pop. And what he did, you guys, was he snapped the tail end of this fish this just a bit behind its belly and he was snapping it and popping it to fall back into the net and it worked i could not believe that he figured out how to do that never have netting a muskie before in his life and not only that he had the presence of mind to try it but that it actually worked and so this fish went from sliding out to him sticking the net a little further and then popping it and then it folded and it fell in instead of falling out and so it folded in it kind of curled and just plopped fell right in and as soon as it fell in you guys the hooks popped out. So I can't believe this fish is even in the net. And immediately I'm, I'm shouting to him, just hold on, just hold on, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. So I open my bale, I let out some line, I set down my rod and I start running to get down these boulders. And the whole time I'm running down these boulders, he's holding the net and the fish just goes nuts. It just starts going bonkers. And he's screaming, literally going, ah, because he's afraid he's going to drop the net and that the fish is going to get out. And so he's screaming and I'm saying, just hold on, just hold on. I'm almost there. I'm almost there. So I finally get to him and I grab the handle, but the way it's situated, you guys, it's a tight little space and we're in the middle of all these big boulders and there's river. Okay. And so I grab the net because it's sticking out behind him, like through his arm here. And I grab the handle and I'm like, okay, I got it. I got it. And he stands up and I'm holding the bar of the net, but I still can't see the fish entirely because he's right in front of me blocking my view. And he stands up and he says, oh my gosh, Jeff, it's 50. It's 50. And the first thing I'm thinking is this kid's never caught a muskie. He's never seen a 50. This could be a 44 because he doesn't know any better. And so my exact words to him are while it's in the net, I say, nah, buddy. I said, I don't think she's 50. I said, but she's at least 48. And at the time, that would have been my biggest Wisconsin muskie. Okay. My previous PB was a 47 in Wisconsin. So I'm thinking, if this is a 48, I'm still jacked. I'm still pumped. This is still an awesome catch. I'm going to freak out. But I tell Frankie, I literally said to him, he'll probably remember this. I said, I don't think she's 50, buddy. I said, she's 48. She might go 49, but she's not more than that. that that's what I'm thinking. Because honestly, you guys, I just didn't believe that I could catch a fish of that caliber in southern Wisconsin on inland waters on this little river. Okay, a, a 50 is almost mythical down by me. So I'm thinking there's no way she's 50, but she's probably 48. And if she's close to 49, even better. I'm going to freak out. So he kind of waddles around me and gets out of my way. And I look at it in the net and I'm like, oh, she's definitely 48. No doubt 48. 
But you guys, I go to gill her, and as soon as I gill her, and I start to lift up to get her out of the net, her gill flap comes all the way down here, you guys. I'll never forget on that day. Normally you have gill rakers, if you get any cuts on your knuckles, it's gonna be like right here, most of them. Sometimes you might have a few up here, but rarely, okay? It's usually gonna be somewhere in this section of your fingers, okay? That's where most of your cuts are. Sometimes you get them up here, especially on smaller fish. Uh, but bigger fish, it's gonna be right here. This fish's gill flap, my whole fist and my wrist was inside, okay? All you saw was this. You couldn't see my wrist or any higher. I was inside the head of this fish, basically. My cuts from the gill rakers, you guys, were right here. This is where all the cuts were from the gills, okay? Just to give you some perspective of how big this thing was and how big its head was. So as soon as I gill it, the wheels start turning and I start thinking, oh my gosh, this thing might be 50, you know? I lift it out of the net and I start to grab it by its belly, but I want it, I have to get it. There's a bunch of boulders all around me. I wanted to get it over these boulders, okay? And just behind these boulders, about 10 yards away, there's this little sand flat of sand and like tall grass coming out of the water, but it's basically like six inches of water. And I wanted to lay the fish in the water and measure it there to keep it in water, okay? To try to protect the fish and not do too much damage to her so I could have a clean, healthy release. So when I lifted it up to get it over this one big boulder, the fish kind of slipped from this hand and it slid down and I'm standing straight up, okay? And when it slips, its tail goes all the way down. It hits me, you know, right about my shin, a little lower than the middle of my shin. And as soon as its tail hits my shin, I look at Frankie and I said, dude, she's 50. She's 50 because I knew there's no way its tail is going to hit me that low if it's not a 50. This thing is huge. So we get it over the boulder. We lay it down to measure it, and it was just really nice to set up. You know, like I said, it's this little flat of like sand and grass coming out of the water, out of the river, and the fish never really had to leave the water except for when I lifted it up to snap a few pictures. We measure it the first time, and I just wanted to see if it was over 50. The first time we measure it, I saw its tail go well past 51 inches, and I started freaking out. I couldn't believe, because right there, I just laid her down, I didn't pinch the tail or nothing, just laid her down and immediately I saw that her tail went way past 51. So I said, oh my gosh, Frankie, she's over 51. Let's snap some pictures real quick and then let's get her a better measurement and then we're gonna let her go. So I lift it up, I'm gonna put up some pictures now. Frankie took a bunch of really good pictures. I think I even got some pictures on the release, which I'll show in a moment. But he snaps as many pictures as he can, as long as I can hold it because she was heavy and after about five to 10 pictures, I started saying, I can't hold her anymore, I gotta put her back down. So we snapped the pictures and I said, okay, Frankie, get down here and help me. We're gonna hold her down, make sure she doesn't move at all, and we're gonna get a really good measurement. Now, I still don't know why I forgot to do this. It may be because I was excited in the heat of the moment, the panic. You know, I just, my, my brain was just going a million miles per hour. But for whatever reason, you guys, I didn't pinch the tail on this fish at all, anytime I measured it. And I don't really care because I know at least at a minimum how long it was, and I don't think I would have gotten more than a half inch maybe three quarters of an inch out of the pinched tail. I don't know, I've had so many guys tell me when they see this fish, they think it's bigger than what I tell them it is because I didn't pinch the tail. Uh, but it doesn't really matter to me because the odds of it being another inch longer are unlikely, okay? You'll get what I mean when I give you the measurement. But we lay it down the second time to get an official measurement minus pinching the tail. We never pinched the tail, whatever it is what it is. And both times we measured it, it was at 52 and a quarter inches, okay? I checked, Frankie checked. I did it again, we checked, we just wanted to make sure. And every time, so we measured it the first time, I just saw that it went past 51, we snapped pictures and then we put it down to get a better measurement. And we measured it two more times quickly, just holding it there without her moving and flopping. And both times we both saw, yeah, she's 52 and a quarter. And again, if I pinched the tail, maybe she was 52 and a half, maybe she was 52 and three quarters, it's highly unlikely that she hit 53. Okay, so that's how I feel about it. You can let me know your thoughts. It doesn't really matter to me because that fish, was by far not only my biggest muskie, period, the biggest muskie of my life, it was also the biggest fish of my life and it still is to this day. But more importantly, that fish is a rare, rare fish to be caught in Southern Wisconsin on inland waters. I've had many conversations with friends of mine, guys that are in the industry, guys that are guides, uh, big YouTubers, you name it. And the, the remarks they have said probably will tell you best how unique and rare and special this fish is. And the best example I can give you, there's many, but the best example I can give you is what Lee Talkin told me from Today's Angler. What's up, Lee? I hope you're doing well. But when I shared this fish with Lee, who has guided in Southern Wisconsin for like 30 years, his exact words to me, and it's funny because shortly after I caught this fish, 
he caught a fish of the size that he gave a comparison to when he made remarks on my fish. And what he told me was, he said, Jeff, that 52 and a quarter you caught on inland waters in southern Wisconsin, he said, that's like catching a 56 plus in Minnesota. And ironically, a couple years later, Lee caught a 56 incher in Minnesota, which is pretty crazy. But that should help give you some perspective. I've had many other guides from different states even say, dude, that fish is rare. That fish is special because of where you caught it and how you caught it. Very few guys can tell you that they've caught a legit 50 incher on inland waters in Wisconsin, but let alone a 51 is really rare, but a 52 plus you guys, that's almost unheard of. Green Bay is a different story, okay? Minnesota is a different story, Lake St. Clair, I could go on and on. But inland waters, and this is probably comparative to places like, you know, Indiana or Ohio or Pennsylvania, um, although I've been seeing some monsters getting caught in Pennsylvania or even like West Virginia. You know, inland waters in Wisconsin, southern Wisconsin, and even northern Wisconsin, it's really hard to find fish that even hit the 50 mark. But to find fish that surpass that, 51, 52, 53, every once in a while they're caught, but you guys, they are extremely rare. So for me, it was my PB, biggest fish in my life, biggest muskie. But the, the, probably the most special thing about this fish itself for me is that I caught it close to home. I caught it on my own home turf, on waters that I fish. I basically guided myself to this fish. And then to make it an even sweeter story, to make it even better, to make it even more, you know, a more sentimental memory for me is that Frankie, a kid I worked with, the first muskie he ever net was, was this fish. And so the fact that he netted for me is just incredible. It's awesome for me to say that I caught a fish this rare. And by the way, a 13 year old kid netted for me. It's just absolutely insane. So needless to say, you guys, that's the story. That's the fish. Catch of a lifetime. Um, I've yet to beat it. It's driving me nuts. I really want to get a 53 and up. I'm sure it'll happen eventually. Uh, but it's a tough fish to beat. I obviously kept that lure. I still have it to this day. And the funny thing is, the last two things I'll tell you about the fish and about the bait is this. So I had caught 75 muskies, you guys, before I caught this 52. Okay? And it's funny because two and a half months... Before I caught this fish, I went to Lake St. Clair for the first time. My two buddies, uh, Jim and Jason, hired Mike Holbert. And uh, I, you know, that was a blessing to me because they basically paid for that trip because I can't afford stuff like that. And it was an incredible experience. Some great memories were made. Jason caught a really nice muskie. It was tough fishing, really tough fishing. Uh, Jason and Jimmy only caught one apiece. Um, I was fortunate to catch six, but I didn't catch any big ones. Uh, but a conversation I'll never forget I had with Mike Holbert when we were leaving the last day. We were heading off the lake and we were about to head home back to Wisconsin. And Holbert, you know, he really wanted me to get a 50 out there. And, and he knew I was really working my butt off to try to get one. I had been fishing Wisconsin all these years. I had fished Minnesota a couple times. And now I had been to Lake St. Clair and it still hadn't happened. And we were driving back to the launch. I'll never forget it. And his exact words to me were, when you catch your 50, you're going to appreciate it more because you've had to work for it. And he started telling me stories of these guys, you know, that he had guided, um, guys that would come out and the second muskie of their life or the fourth muskie of their life was like a 53 or a 55, you know, just they only catch one muskie and the next one they caught was a 54 or, or bigger. And, and he would describe to me how they weren't even that excited, how they didn't really appreciate it, how they were like, oh, I guess that's nice. And they just kind of released it with little excitement. And here Holbert's like, do you know how hard it is to catch a 54, 55, 56? And he would tell me that it was hard for him because he'd want to celebrate this fish. And sometimes these newer anglers just didn't understand the gravity of, of how rare a fish of that size is and how much work and effort it takes most people to catch a fish of that caliber. So he's talking to me. He's telling me, listen, I, I wish you would have got one here but this is just gonna make you appreciate it even more. And so the first thing I wanna tell you is he was right. Holbert, if you're watching, you were 100% right. And the fact that I was able to catch this fish on my home turf, on my own waters, kind of fishing my way, my style from shore, my appreciation just went out the roof and it was incredible, it was awesome. The second thing I'll say about that bait is that mid Medusa, I had never had a follow, I'd never caught a muskie until I caught this 52 and a quarter. So obviously I changed my feelings about that bait and I didn't sell it. And since that time, you guys, that Medusa, that exact Medusa, I should try to go get it and show it to you because it is absolutely destroyed. I'll probably do that before the video ends. But that Medusa has caught more muskies for me than any other Medusa 
I, I've ever owned, okay? So it went from being about to be sold, this close to getting sold, to now that's that same Medusa that caught my 52 and a quarter, it's probably caught me anywhere between 15 to 20 muskies since. And I just have a hard time retiring it because it is just a fish catching machine and it's caught me some other quality ones in the mid 40s here in Wisconsin. So I guess I'll leave you with that. You guys, I know this video is long, uh, but this is obviously not only the biggest fish of my life, but muskies are my favorite species to chase. Uh, so this fish is unique, it's rare, the story is exciting. Frankie, thank you for an incredible net job. Rich, my father-in-law, thank you for changing my mind literally the day before and telling me to go check out this spot. Uh, it just goes to show you guys, you can't really take credit for every fish you catch in regards to scenarios like this. If you have somebody giving you a tip or, or giving you help, or if you're fishing out of somebody else's boat, or if you have a buddy there that's netting the fish for you, the reality is, you guys, it's always a team effort. And I can't take credit for this fish by myself. My father-in-law de deserves credit. Frankie deserves a lot of credit for netting it for me. The good Lord, for whatever reason, on a day that there shouldn't have even been a bluegill in there, I don't know why, but he, he just was throwing me a bone. And this giant muskie that had no business being there, the dam was broke, there's no current, the water's low, there's dead leaves everywhere, there's no bait fish in sight. For whatever reason, this monster was there. I can't take credit for that. And I know a lot of guys, they kind of get a little bit arrogant and they start to get a little cocky once they start catching a lot of fish or they start catching big fish especially and they start to believe in their own legend if you will and I respect every angler that puts in the time and the effort I know how hard it is to catch fish and how hard it is to catch big fish trust me I appreciate and respect that but at the same time you guys I always say it's better to be lucky than it is to be good and everyone has been taught by somebody else. Everyone was introduced to fishing by somebody else. Everyone has learned things from somebody else. There is nobody on the planet that is literally start to finish a self-made angler. And anybody that thinks that, all I gotta say is they need Jesus and I'm praying for them. So um, I really do like to give credit to where it's due. And as much as I'm excited and thankful I caught this fish, it wouldn't have happened without a lot of help from other people, from the good Lord. And um, you know, I, I just have learned that, you know, I'm, I'm thankful that big fish decide to eat sometimes when I'm fishing. They, they, they usually don't show up and I usually get disappointed and I usually uh, don't have too many opportunities at True Monsters. I don't know why, I just don't have the magic touch like, like Robbie from Today's Angler. Uh, but at the same time, I'm extremely grateful for this catch and I just hope I get to experience a catch like that again here in the near future. So that's it you guys, I know this video was a little longer but this is obviously a special catch to me. I hope you enjoyed the story. Let me know, what if, if you're a muskie angler, let me know what your PB is, let me know where you caught it, what you caught it on, how you caught it. Pretty cool to catch a giant like this casting from shore in southern Wisconsin. It's hard to beat that, but I'm determined to do it. So stay tuned for more you guys, I'll see you next time, and like always, just keep casting.